Well, uh, we're here in. I thought I always thought you were in Petaluma, but it's Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sonoma County. All right, we're here with Taylor Schultz again, and this time we're in a shop, not in a hotel room, in Vegas. Yes. There we go. So I right, put it as close as you can. Close as I can. That way we can make sure. Put it on the table. Are we good now? Does <coughs> it work? All right. Can Dude, you how you me? been, man? I've been all right. Yeah. It's yeah. uh it's it's been a long time. I, I've had a hard time. We were just kind of talking before we went, you know, more or less on this this podcast about my connection to the industry has been very different in the last four years. And I felt like you've had an exponential growth as far as like getting more involved in all the aspects of it, which is awesome to see. I guess the the more you uh Say it again. Sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. First, first video podcast on this trip. Yeah. So, you know, like the whole industry side of things, and I feel like you're getting more involved in the industry side of it as far as not the industry of custom paint as far as the end user, but the products, the brands, the you've, you've worked with brands like House of Color for many years and, you know, just producing stuff to help make it easier to be a custom painter. Well, you definitely, uh, over the years, you see flaws in like what the market needs right so mm -hmm. things that you need as a custom painter that aren't being provided you know and you want to provide them yeah i've always wanted to be that person that's yeah going out of their way to to make it to where you can get things that you're going to use right so stencils or sizing or stuff like that and then uh, you know the the corporate machine of the paint world is um it takes a toll on you yeah as, yeah. a, as an artist right because you're you're an artist that's fueled by creativity they're a corporation that's fueled by revenue yeah so i always call it being a monkey on a stage right mm -hmm. so um i've been a monkey on the stage for years now and i've almost separated myself a lot from from that scene of I've, I've, and a little bit of social media uh, recently but um i feel like mental breaks and mental stuff is good for the yeah. soul it definitely is the the aspect of I think that you you and I both kind of grew up in the custom. If I remember from our, our first podcast, we kind of came up. I guess we cut our teeth in the same era, like the mid two thousands, if you will, uh, which is a different paint culture than what we live in now. It's a different totally everything. Different. Yeah, totally different. Um, I think I started working in the custom shop in probably two thousand three or two thousand four. Mm -hmm. And I opened my own place in 2006 or 2007. Yeah. So back then there was no social media. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. There was So your biggest advertising was somebody seeing your bike at a show or at an event or something and then asking who painted that. Yeah, yeah. That was your biggest source of, of self-promotion. Um, nowadays, everybody and their mother is a, yeah. a self-promotion well, you know, marketing person. <laughs> Because of that as well, like the way to figure out how to do things was much different. Like I felt like once social media happened, the uh, the sharing of, of tricks and, and trades and, you know, there was always classes. You always had airbrush action yep. and, you know, those those kind of getaway things. But, you know, those were expensive to go to, you know, I mean, back in 2006, you were paying, you know, a thousand dollars a thousand bucks or for, to go to a class and you had to get a hotel and a yeah. flight so you'd you know you'd be investing two or three grand yeah. into like learning something from somebody you follow through the custom paint world right and i never i never went to a class like that um i think the importance of growing up in that area though is that you you built a, a foundation a good foundation to build your business and yourself up yeah. on where i feel like nowadays it's kind of the reverse where you're Everybody wants the attention, not the foundation of what they're mm. working with. Um, yeah. And that's difficult to wrap my brain around sometimes. But um, is it hard? It's hard to, you know, because you do a lot of classes and we'll get into that further along. But in a way, when you start doing classes, you become more or less mentoring some people. Yeah. And a lot of people's idea, I feel like what I see is people almost want to have a brand before they have the skills to back up the brand. Yep. Yep. You know, 
and they want um, social media partnerships with people before they're actually good at what they're doing. Yeah. So they're they're going ten steps ahead of where they should be, and I always try and tell people to, um, you know, learn the fundamentals, go away for three years and just practice your craft and then come out swinging, yeah. you know, don't come out swinging when you, you know, you don't get in the ring with Ali cause you think you could box, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So that's the type of mentality I have is, um, you got to really, um, build your foundation and build your skills. And then when you come out, you come out swinging. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. And that's the other thing that I find really hard to explain to people, especially when I've had a, a very small amount of people that would want to come to the shop and learn how to do things. You know, when you set them down at a, at a wet sand table and you teach them like, Hey, look, this is the foundation for these skills. Yeah. You know, I was like, you can always, you know, I wet sanded for a shop and then stole tape, <laughs> if yeah. you will, and went home and laid out flames on the refrigerator to practice that on my own time. Mm hmm. But at the shop, my job was only to wet sand. It was through those that extracurricular help or extracurricular effort that I was able to grow those skills and eventually, years down the line, start doing my own shit like that. I can't that. tell you how many people have tried to come to work for me, and then I hand them a broom, and I say, here you go. <sighs> Bro, don't even get me <laughs> <laughs> You know, because my whole thing is if somebody comes and tries to work with me, if I'm working harder than you, there's something wrong here. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I started, I was the first guy at the shop every morning, and I was the last guy to leave yep. every day. Mm -hmm. And on Saturdays and Sundays, I was in the shop practicing welding and trying to yeah, figure out how yeah. to do stuff on my own time. Um, nowadays, everybody comes in, and they just want the glory, and they don't want to do the work. Well, you you hand them a bunch of pieces of a bike, and you say, oh, this whole pile of stuff, we need wet sanded by the end of the day. Mm. And by the end of the day, their hands are bleeding because they wet sanded all day. A lot of times they don't show up the next day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, it's not all glitz and glamour. It's not all uh, what people think it's cracked up to be. Um, um, you know, that 30 second video that you see on social media, it might be a month's worth of work for somebody. Yeah. You yep. know, so um, yeah, the reality of things versus the social media side of things are very different. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, I wish, you know, and that's kind of the hard part for me. Like I haven't really got into the whole phase of wanting to create videos around our paint. Yeah. Not because I'm, I'm not trying to gatekeep or like hold any secrets. It's just that they're time consuming. They're very, um, well, you got shit to do. Everybody's yeah. got shit to do. You and know? you, I, I only have so much bandwidth to be yeah. able to focus on the intricate things that I got going on. Yeah. Then to also think to hit record yeah. and then to dance around my shit to make a real. And, that, you know. and you know, I've had a difficult time finding somebody that I can rely on to film as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like I had somebody for years that helped me and unfortunately we had a falling out as a friendship, but um, I haven't had somebody come in and have the same equal amount of passion that I have for my paintwork as they yeah. have for capturing it in yes. videography. Yes. So, it's tough. You know, you want to be able, if I had my choice, I'd be filming, promoting, talking on the phone, sanding, painting all at the same time. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you're only one person. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the, as I get older, I realize that less is more, you know? Oh um, yeah. And, I mean, that's exactly what we started a, talking about. We got here. Yeah. Having a, a, a balance is a huge thing that I've learned. Um, you said you're 41 or 42. Yeah. Going on 42. I just turned 40 and, um, you know, you just realize that things don't work quite the same way as your yeah. body does. You yeah. know, your shoulders, your elbows, your hands, and um, finding that balance is is something that you got to really uh, appreciate in life. You know? Yeah, I always I always think back to the you know the 15 years or 10 years before social media was a tool hmm. of how much time I spent really trying to learn and that i mean my wife could tell you like just being at the shop till three in the morning every yeah. day waking up and going back at nine or ten oh, yeah. and i have zero desire to do that anymore it's but i miss that drive yeah you know what i mean um i think once you kind of reach a level like that you and i have gotten to and then you look down you realize that the mindset of looking down isn't the same mindset of looking up at what mm. you thought was at the top, right? Yeah, or yeah. What you might call the top, you know, whatever it is in this industry, whatever people think that the end goal is. But you, uh, the hindsight is very different in this industry where you looking down, 
you know, some I spent my entire twenties in the shop till two, three in the morning, like you're saying. Yeah. And now I look back, I'm like, man, I should have went on that trip to Mexico with my <laughs> friends. You know? Yeah. Like I should have went did this and I should have went that. No regrets, but man, like, you know, uh, looking back on it, there's a lot of stuff that you know I could have, you know, uh, probably done traded off. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm. Uh, I don't know if you're this way, but like. Um, all the other aspects of my life are starting to catch up. Right. So, so my, <laughs> I'm good at working and I'm good at this and that, but I, you know, I'm trying to catch up with family stuff and I'm trying to be a better person in that Alex yeah, aspect yeah. as like a, a, somebody that's a, in that role in my family. But I used um, to say this a lot. I always felt like the easiest thing to do is just go to work. It, it, you know, cause for some you people, had the most control. Yeah. yeah. For some people, <laughs> Some that's where you have this thing to do. <laughs> you, you almost have like complete control over how everything happens and goes in here. And then yeah. you go out and you try to live a normal life and, you know, relationships, friendships, uh, family, like you yeah. were saying, all that stuff is really hard because you're used to having control of everything. Yeah. You know? I don't like a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't like a lot of people out there. I think, um, people have a skewed sense of reality you know i spend a lot of time just here at the shop or at home and uh or with my girlfriend doing some sort of adventure or something like that but um yeah i don't i i try and cut out all the negative mm -hmm. un like quality things the things mm -hmm. that aren't quality out yeah. of my life like I, I try not to do that i don't know if you're the same way but i i've narrowed my little circle down to a few really yeah. good friends and you know i think maybe where me and you might differ is that i'm a very social person yeah and i kind of I, I think being trapped in a shop all day long alone i crave you know mm. uh, i want to go sit at chipotle and just see people yeah. you know eat lunch and just be around other my wife's the opposite where she is a barber so she's dealing with everybody's shit all day long yeah you know well, so we have a, like a therapist position too. yeah <laughs> she needs we're gonna work on some pricing for her and her uh her other services she offers yeah. um but you know i, I think one of the things you you just kind of chimed on that i really I, I as more of a perspective from you to maybe help my own like uh look at it is you know the early days of custom paint, you know, we're talking, you know, 2004 to like, you know, 10, right? Of our, of our, at least my life, and I think maybe yours as well. It felt like the path or the goal as an artist was like to get to this point of teaching classes or to be a brand ambassador for certain paint things and, or whatever, or be on Being TV. Sponsored, or be, a big yeah. thing back early was trying to get on TV. Everybody yeah. tried. I remember I worked for a guy that all he wanted to do was get on TV. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was just. I think, I mean, at a certain point, it might have been like a, a, a way to kind of the one opportunity to, to like get out there in a certain way. But I think that as social, as YouTube kind of grew alongside TV, and of course, reality TV kind of became less reality, mm. if you will, I think that the a lot of the younger now that I think the demographic now that watches or would be our audience is not really a TV person. They're a no. YouTube person, yeah. you know, but so how do you, you know, for me, like once I felt like I got to that point, you know, maybe arrogantly, but once I felt like I started being at that, that position where I felt like I should have been, I hate saying it like this, but I felt like I should have been, you know, afforded some of these opportunities. They're just not there. After I put in the work of going places, mm -hmm. after I've, you know, created the paint jobs and it's just like the industry changed, yeah. you know, right at that point where fuck, it's my turn to get a little bit of a kickback, yeah. uh, you know, an opportunity to work with brands. And I mean, look what happened to the magazines. Everybody wanted to be in a magazine and now yeah, yeah all the magazines are gone, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, that's, that gets back to that idea of like people thinking that there's an end goal. Um, when I think that a lot of people, I don't know, they, they, they envision it as something that it's not like it's a fantasy thing nowadays mm -hmm. where we had a kind of an, a grip of what we wanted as an end goal a little bit when we yeah. were there, it's definitely changed as a industry. So I feel like there is really no end goals right now. Yeah. You like, know, there is no, um, I mean, if you get a job, yeah. like a normal job, which I don't know what those look like, but a normal job, the goal is to put in your years and retire with a 401k God, and sounds terrible. it does <laughs> until you start As looking at a creative person. It, just it is terrible. I I'm mean, so anti-cubicle. <laughs> you know I mean? <laughs> I'm with you on that, you know, but like there, when you look at like the structure of going somewhere in that, in that world, you have, 
you know, it's time plus so-and-so equals like rewards for your job mm -hmm. if you do a good job. Right. Yeah. But here it's like, I mean, you're capped at some point to how much money you're going to be able to really make on a project mm -hmm. unless you kind of go into other markets, which, you know, some of the bigger markets to, for custom painters are going to be the boat world. And I don't want to facilitate or like some airplanes and airplanes, boats or some sort of crazy low rider that people actually have a budget to paint. And how many are those out there? And you'd need how many a, a year to sustain a, a lifestyle and I mean, and the amount of work by yourself. I mean, what you're going to you yeah. probably be able to do one of those crazy low riders in a year. One. Yeah. You know? So how, how much? I mean, yeah. so that's what I'm saying. Like there's there's like these. I think I think when I was younger and I was like, I don't know if you remember the first time you got paid a thousand dollars to do something. Oh, I felt rich, I know. <laughs> you know, because I was at an age where I was so young to, you know, make a thousand dollars for a project yeah. was like. Or, you know, and, and, and multiply that number further along in my career. The first yeah. time I got 10 grand to paint a bike, yeah, I was yeah. like, fuck, I remember dude. that point. I remember, I guess I remember like 1500 bucks to paint yeah. a bike. And even back then, you were all excited about it. But then I never really viewed it as a money thing, though, I don't think. I viewed it as like a stepping stone. You yeah, know, the, the money was like the stepping stone of the quality that yeah, I felt like I could get yeah. for it. So I, I'm not going to sit here and say I didn't want money, but... I knew that to get the money, I had to create the art. So yeah. there was still an emphasis on being good at what I was and doing. Getting back to the fundamental, the the foundation part is when you start out that way, you understand that to, those levels, right? Now people are trying to charge ridiculous amounts of money for stuff that they shouldn't be that they should yeah. be charging less than half for. Yeah, you know what I mean. So um, I think that understanding isn't as as a reality as we had, you know, growing yeah. up. Um, well, I mean, if you think about it too, like custom paint is be maybe, maybe becoming a novelty if I'm, if I'm using that analogy the correct way, because there's only so many people out there that have the more or less disposable income to pay for the things that at the level at the higher end painters are going to get. Yeah. Right. And so when you have them taking a chance on somebody who's not quite on that level yet, but they're still charging, you know, X amount of dollars for paint job then that kind of might push that guy out of this space to ever want it again because mm. of the quality of something they got yeah. versus yeah, kind of jaded yeah, yeah it's that's what kind of happened with the the bike building world the choppers and stuff yeah oh yeah you get Look someone that's willing to pay eighty thousand dollars for a chopper and it's a piece of shit yeah. that dude's not gonna buy another you chopper buy that bike right now for 10 grand probably <laughs> probably less <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> and you just want the sns motor out yeah, of it you a, know you just want the parts um it's funny it's a it's a weird thing too because you're a creative person on that side and then you kind of grow up the whole system is normalized to be a a, a worker mm. right have you ever heard that about like the yeah. Rothschild thing yeah that the whole, eight hour work week eight hour school whole, like, day we're not creating creative people we're creating workers or something yeah, like yeah. that and it took me a long time to kind of deprogram myself from a lot of that that you grow up learning from school is is a lot of that um you know you got to fall in line with the person in front of you type mm -hmm. mentality um and so i don't know if it's like a the new generation is kind of really lost because they're a, a product of that environment times 10 yeah nowadays so i don't know if they're once they get that taste of freedom now they're all over the place. Yeah, you know that's a good. I mean? That's a really good point because us being a similar in age, we grew up half of our life for the most part without social media. Yeah, and so I mean, I had a pager. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I had one for a short amount of time. Uh, I'll let this truck pass. But so what I'm getting at is like, I think you know, for me to find, you had to kind of live in the right area or be around the right people to find these kind of subcultures like custom paint. I, I grew up in a body shop, man. Yeah, me too. And yeah. never knew. I mean, that's how that's how removed from what is sitting in front of us on this helmet, from what I was doing and hated in high school, having yeah. a wet Santa car. And I remember I worked. I was working in a body shop. This was probably two thousand, two thousand one, and a guy came in on a bike that he had custom painted and it was just the full checkered wave flag yeah. thing. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I want to do that. Yeah. And now I, I, 
don't know the last time I did a checkered paint job, but you know, it's that inspiration where it was like, wow, there's more to this, you yeah. know, like body shop life and refinish world is like the first two steps to a custom mm -hmm. paint job. Mm -hmm. There's 20 other steps beyond that, Yep. you know, and, and products are totally different. That's why, you know, you and I kind of talked about it is we're in charge of, you know, this huge part of promoting paint in general. Yeah. But the revenue for custom paint is just a small sliver, you mm -hmm. know, where refinish is this huge portion of a lot of these companies revenue, but you don't see guys that are refinishers promoting paint yeah. for huge corporations. Yeah. They ask guys like us to come in and be a monkey on a stage and promote their products. I remember I was at the Napa Expo, Steve Gibson and I, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we sold, we were there and it's all the Napa people that work at Napa's own Napa stores, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And it's all invite only. And we were doing our thing. I was pinstriping on one side of the booth. He was on the other side airbrushing and people would come up to us, mm -hmm. start talking about products. We would have catalogs. We would sell them on trying to sell mm. custom paint through their Napa store, walk them over to the salesman and the salesman would go, oh, okay, yeah, we got, we got that. Let me write you down for sale. Nice. And I asked the guy at the end of the show, I said, well, what, how'd you guys do? Oh, we sold $6 million worth of paint. Be like, so me and Steve sold $6 million yeah. worth of paint. You guys over here are having a frat boy beer party at the booth, you know? <laughs> and uh, so what are you guys going to do? This is like, I think it was like right after COVID and it was like that shortage of all the yeah. paint from that resin company that, uh -huh. that caught on fire. Caught on fire, yeah. I'm like, what are you guys going to do when you can't fill those orders? Well, that's not our problem we're sales, mm. you know? So different here we world. are. Yeah. It's a different world. You know, it's a different mentality. It's a different, it's a corporate machine. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, Josh and Tim that wear blue suits that go to the, the stuff, that, you know, the corporate yeah. guys, you know, like that's just not us. You know what I mean? Have you ever thought about like how it feels like the culture like the cruising culture, the, you know, like just the, those little, those, those pathways that lead you into like, whether it cuss, whether it be custom paint or, you know, fabrication, like into like building mini trucks, all these things, you know, cars that I guess in the nineties when we were young and there was cruise culture, there was the import scene, there was all these other scenes. A lot of those cars are kind of unobtainable now for a lot of younger people and it's crazy because the imports that we were used to are now almost <sighs> classics Bro, the two i kids. i was a nissan guy before i got into bikes yeah. and i used to do the the motor the japanese motors and shit every once in a while for for shits and giggles i get on a marketplace right and just see what the old 240s are going yeah. for like 10 grand for a shell and i'm like y'all are these ain't c10s dude yeah yeah out of line <laughs> you know but so I'm, i think about that and i'm like okay well my son who's 14 is never gonna i'm not gonna say it's never but i can't see him ever having a connection to that world of the automotive or you know maybe motorcycle because it is a little bit cheaper to some degree but how do you get newer generations to want to be a part of this scene and when i say younger generations i don't mean the kids that are old enough to like like 20 year olds i'm saying the ones that are 10 15 right now you know and <sighs> Well, the tough thing too about that is is that we're growing up in a society where it's like it's everything safety first. Yeah. So to get those kids to get on a motorcycle, you know, and their parents to get them on a motorcycle, yeah, is so. I, I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. You know, they're worried about you know the kid next things. to them sneezing on them. You know <laughs> what I mean? And to get them on a motorcycle is probably going to be next to impossible. You yeah. Know? So it's a very fearful thing. And the way that things are going with electric vehicles as well. Like, what does that look like? Yeah. I don't are we going to be custom painting Tesla's here in 20 years. Yeah, like, and that's the thing is like, <laughs> you know, you remember when raps became a thing and that was kind of like supposed to be the take our jobs away kind of deal. I just feel like it just found its own niche and went it its did. own direction. It, it found its, its own place to kind of uh, reside, you know. But even now, like, you see a lot of people with exotic cars that will just wrap them and do these, like, you know, Call of Duty-style graphics on it and shit. I know. And that's fine. It's all, it's all good and dandy. But I feel like with more and more of these companies trying to innovate different types of coatings, I mean, if you really think about it, like Cerakote, it's kind of an idiot-proof coating, you oh, know. Yeah. 
and it looks pretty good and it's not i mean it, it i'm not saying anybody could just do it but you could probably get it right on the second or third try i mean if you don't know how to spray and that stuff likes to be thin anyway yeah you could get away with putting it on pretty easy exactly you know? so Cerakote's an amazing product, by the way. I just yeah. Cerakote a bunch of parts from my old Chevy, but um, but when when that scene or when these these coating companies start to evolve, yeah. and it becomes more less less ava available for us to manipulate it as custom painters, like mm. I wonder where the the scene or the industry of us really goes. Well, at, you know, I could tell you this that. I haven't even told anybody. We talked about it earlier. I'm expanding and, and partnered with somebody uh, who was the, I don't know, his, his role was with Matrix, but mm -hmm. he was pretty much one of the co-founders of Matrix, and we we're coming out with our own paint line. Mm. And um, it's going to be launching in early springtime. Nice. And getting into the kind of the bellows of of paint manufacturing and figuring out that there's only a few things that people can really pick from in the paint world. Mm. And now I've kind of dove into that whole world of, you know, candy dyes and clear coat resins and pigmentation and all that stuff. Um, you kind of really get a, a eye opening experience of coatings, right? Mm. So, um, it's an exciting thing. Um, myself and Dave Bernori are doing it. Um, it's going to be called Rogue. Mm. So Rogue Custom Finishes is what it's going to be called. Nice. Um, we've already sourced um, candy concentrates. Dave is responsible for most of the clear coats that were in the Matrix line. He's a chemist as well. So we've developed um, clear coats already. We've got um, resins. We've got color pigmentation already. Colors nice. already going. Um, some really kick-ass primers and sealers. So yeah, we were just working on labels, um, some containers, some cool containers. We're actually the candy concentrates are going to be in. Have you ever seen those um, one-piece pressed aluminum bottles, like what you buy at like a concert or a yeah, like yeah. a Bud Light, but a big a yeah. big yeah, it's like a mini version of that. Okay. So no more three-piece bottles that leak eventually. Yeah. Or you we Does pop it the pop top. it? <laughs> so this is a twist top. Yeah. You know, so it's actually going to be a really cool thing to wear the. Um, it's a one piece bottle. It's never going to leak. Mm. You know, so seal up good. That way, it doesn't dry out. It doesn't dry like out. You're not going to get some weird crustiness on the end. Um, obviously, I always strain my candy stuff anyway. But um, yeah, the click the clear coats are kick ass. There's two VOC compliant ones and two non compliant mm. national rule ones. One's a, a four to one. Medium solids, kind of like a workhorse clear. Yeah. And the other one's kind of a Euro style, high solids clear. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, I've known you to, to be you. kind of involved in that for many years now. You know, like even like from the stuff I remember you were working with Brian with a long time ago, uh, like working on like uh, inner coats and things like that. I think finding, I think the thing is that like there are, there, I felt like I was crazy and I kind of came in here arguing or not arguing, but, uh, discussing it, yeah. the, you know, kind of bitching, if you yeah. will. Like the thing is that like a lot of the companies I feel like have been removing things from the, the actual paints themselves. Well, they're not custom painters. Yeah. So they're taking away these things that like, I used to be able to do this with this paint and now I can't anymore. Well, that expensive additive that would allow it to adhere or this, aluminum that was in this silver that was really badass to mm -hmm. to you is expensive to them yeah so they get rid of things that are expensive and replace them with they're basically things. like drug dealers like chopping up uh, yeah and may and kind of you know watering it well, down. I, I feel like people don't put in baking soda with it. yeah understand how it works either so the paint manufacturer manufactures a product puts it in the can then it goes to a distributor so mm. then the distributor sells it to a jobber and the yeah. jobber sells it to you. So if you're a drug dealer, that's stomped on four times before you get it, right? Yeah. So imagine that's marked up four times before you receive it. Yeah. So, um, and that's kind of an old way of thinking. That's a refinish way of thinking. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? It's, yep. not a, it's not a custom painting type of thinking. So a custom painting type of thinking is I want to go direct to the source. Yeah. It's like a, that movie American Gangster. I don't. Yeah. Want, I'm going directly to the source with this paint company. I'm not going to somebody and relabeling their stuff 
or anything like that. I'm making it with Dave, mm. you know? So that's one of the cool things is that we're able to give a better product to the consumer at a direct price. Yeah, you're right. That yeah. that whole system of the jobber system and how it kind of goes to a, a national distributor down to a jobber, down to you. And, you know, you, you the job like, yeah, you know, put your, let me get your business information. I'll cut you a deal on it. It's like the same deal you get on Amazon for yeah. the most part. And but that's the mentality now is the Amazon world. Well, imagine <clears throat> there's no, there's no tech support either. Mm. So back in the day, you used to have a badass painter that worked behind the counter that was retired that would tell you about the paint that they had in the paint store. Yeah. Now yeah. there's nobody like that. And if they do, they don't know anything about the custom end of it. They yeah, know everything sure. about what they learned at the the clinic that the refinish company yeah, taught them yeah. that weekend. They threw on and gave them you hot know? dogs, yeah. Yeah, gave you hot dogs and hamburgers. So this is something that we're going to be able to support the whole brand. If there's a need for something, we'll be able to make it. Um, and that's the nice thing about it. It's kind of cutting out and redeveloping custom paint entirely. That yeah. is, that's a much needed thing. Because to be honest with you, man, on my end, like – the amount of material consumption or the amount of materials they keep going up the and then they, they go up for no reason they go up but yeah just the, it's like they a, tell you that it's because of this and that but it's, there's no reason yeah they just it's do like it's, it's they can it's shareholders yeah. it's, it's uh it's yeah. that and basically it it makes it harder whenever you like i said for me as a custom painter i felt like i dreamed of being able to sell a paint job at this price now but with the cost of materials and cost of living you know the shop rent everything going up it's like you're kind of like the only thing I can squeeze is now like my own profitability out of doing the job and or doing it in a way that you're doing it faster to save yourself time, which you know, usually sacrifices cut, yeah, quality, yeah. which is just something that I refuse to do. And but you, I mean, as you evolve as a custom painter, eventually you're going to get faster at what you're doing because of experience. Yeah. But that's not what I mean. I mean, like you're having to do it exponentially faster because this person doesn't have the budget exactly um, and and you don't want to sacrifice quality with cheaper products um, yeah. the main reason why you never i mean it's it's more it's harder now well, it's not harder but like when you and you said the same thing like most of my work is not from my local market it's no. it's through the mail through some of my stuff is through the mail yeah. so when you when they open up this box you you want your shit to be dialed yeah no problems with the paint no no oh man i'm sorry i didn't see that yep. you know it's kind of like back in the day you know like oh shit like uh let, go load this up so he didn't see this part <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> you know but that's like er, earlier days like that you know that 10 years of almost grinding trying to learn the craft and and learn how to eliminate the mistakes or the uh the problems that come up yeah. like that's that's the thing that you know going back to what we were talking about like people putting in time that's what you're putting in time for like yeah. Anybody can go out on a golf course and sometimes hit the ball straight. Uh, yeah. But to go out and hit it straight every time is the same concept. It, it takes time and practice to get that shit down. Mm -hmm. And and that that's also knowing how to keep your shot dialed, you know? I you know, I'm I'm like a neat freak too, so mm -hmm. I feel like if you're in a dirty shop, you're gonna create dirty work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. just a mentality. Not it physically being dirty, but like it just as a mindset, you just can't create clean work when you have a yeah. Shop. If you have to look for everything, if you have to clean to start working, then your take like your your initial yeah. like like motivation to start doing the job is it, it's you're, you you got to yeah. work to work yeah. basically. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Well, you're. I expect nothing less in your shop. The way it's set up, it's dialed. Every it's spot smaller. has a. Yeah, it's smaller than my original shop, but it's. Um, it's more of a studio space, I like to call it, than like a shop shop. Yeah, yeah. You know, because my older shop, I mean, you could pull a whole car in and disassemble that thing and do a complete paint job. But your, you know, your paint job you painted the day before is covered in dust from the guy that's next to you sanding. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So this place, it's it's more of a studio. It's two stories. Um, I, you know, I got TVs and stuff in here for entertainment. And I just I just kind of come in here and just zone chill out. And yeah, zone out and grind. That's the, that's how my shop is. You saw my spot, and it's yeah. it's like it becomes more of a man cave than anything. Yeah, because you spend so much time there. Yeah, you know? and that's I don't know. I just I I dream. We talked about it too. Is is dreams about having a, a home shop, and that's eventually what I'm gonna probably mm -hmm. end up doing because I just um, I like the ability of just you know working at home and having that freedom, and mm -hmm. um, not to mention all the permitting and everything that yeah, <laughs> goes yeah. I can't imagine out California. here California <laughs> um, so did you skirt around it by trying to do this more as a studio than a like a paint yeah and the, the, the 
I'm like right under the amount that I have before I can like step up oh, yeah, the permit yeah. level, you know? So the liquid that I'm um, producing isn't at the level of like, let's say a body shop, yeah, you know? So I feel like that's how I get away with a lot of stuff. And if they come in here, I have it pretty spick and span. So where like, they're not going to ding me for open containers yeah, and paint yeah. and all that other stuff, you know? Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a main thing. I, I felt like when I at one point I was kind of looking for a new shop before I did all the remodeling, mm -hmm. and I would tell them what I do. And as soon as I said paint, they just I think that they just think dirty body, body shop, shop with dust everywhere yeah. and parts stacked. I was like, no, 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 it's more like a studio. Yeah. And you try to explain that to people, I'm like, no, we don't want any paint shops in here. I'm yeah. like, God damn it. I know. You know, it's but, funny. My landlord here, I, uh, I, uh, let's see, what was I doing? I he was cleaning up the unit next door. And I went over, introduced myself, and he was very, he's like older guy, yeah. you know, concrete company guy, like very old school. And um, I knew right away he just saw me for my tattoos. Yeah. He didn't see me for like, you know, a younger entrepreneur yeah. type guy or whatever. So I just, every day I would go over there while he was working and just say what's up and try and talk with him. <clears throat> my buddy was my AT&T guy, and he came to hook up my AT&T here. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know that him and I were friends. So he goes over and, and had to go in that unit that he was working in to hook yeah. up my AT&T. He goes, Oh man, I just wanted to let you know, you have a really good tenant over there now. And he's a really good guy. And the landlord goes, yeah, I just can't get over the tattoos. <laughs> 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 so that was a few years ago. And now he can't wait to come in here. Every time he shows up, we, he comes in the shop and checks out the helmets. I'm doing oh, that's or cool. This and that, you know, like he's, a, yeah. he's, I've broken that wall down. So I feel like I accomplished something with that, but I don't no, know that's where good. I was going, but yeah. No, that, I understand <laughs> that. That's part of me sometimes like, I mean, you, you've kind of extended on into the, in, into the, the whole facial thing. Facial reason. Yeah. 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 I have them all under my face, which, you know, it is what it is. People, you know, if you talk to me for five minutes, yeah. you don't see him anymore. You know, the, the guy I kind of learned how to paint from, he used to have this, like his head was tattooed up yeah. way back in the day. Not saying it was like before it was a thing, but yeah. before it was like mainstream, you would see it on the street. Like mm -hmm. you went to prison, you'd see it. Right. Yeah. And he, and I, you know, he'd always say like, you know, I did this because that same mentality we were talking about earlier. Like if we're at an easy rider show or something, I want someone to remember me hmm. that guy that's like, you know, it looks like that because yeah there wasn't a lot of people that looked like that. Yep. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, like you're, you're kind of making yourself kind of stand out more as the thing. Right. But obviously that's also right when the tattoo culture <laughs> kind of blew up as well and became very mainstream, you know, with artists coming into it. Yeah, so. I don't know if you know or have experienced this, but the tattoo world in our world is very similar. Yes. And so like one of my best friends is a tattoo artist who tattoos me and he tells me about his scenarios with customers and i it's very similar yeah you know and um i never viewed it as a um rebellion thing or a um i want to be different or anything like that i viewed it as like uh i was painting on my own canvas yeah yeah you know what i mean i, I really appreciate and enjoy it's one of the few things that i enjoy that i do for myself um i don't do it to myself but i enjoy being a tattoo. part yeah i, yeah. I enjoy the whole process yeah as you get older it, it's it definitely hurts a lot more yeah that's kind yeah. of my thing is that i i i apprenticed for a while and the guy that i was apprenticing under he did a lot of tattoos on me some of them i'm not really happy about You're but just gonna cover them up? no i'm not gonna <laughs> cover them up i feel like i don't know it, part of me wants to because then you you have a homeboy or my wife she did all her shit like like she planned it <laughs> yeah. you know and my shit's like i don't know kitchen stuff yeah. and, and all that kind of mess and uh but, you know, every once in a while I get the itch. We were actually talking about it last night about I was telling her how I want to just kind of connect and have like just mm. almost like a whatever halter top, it, if you will. Yeah, I got uh, my, my arms go across into my, shoulder, yeah. my chest and then my sides. And I was thinking about connecting my stomach up so it doesn't look like I'm just have a chest plate, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of so I don't know, man. Like it's but, you know, <laughs> I sound like every customer out there like shit's expensive, man. Yeah. And I'm I'm just kind of used to like back in the day working through the shop. I, I didn't really have to pay for it. So yeah. it's a retrain of the brain to get to the mindset of wanting to spend the money for it. Yeah. You know, and and uh, not to cut you off, but finding an artist that you want to fuck with. Right. Because you'll see their Instagram and yeah. it's fire. And then they're 
their enthusiasm for working on you is not the same enthusiasm you see in the artwork on their Instagram. And you're and you feel like you're in the wheelhouse well, of that, what they like. That's it crosses over to custom paint too. I don't know if you experience this, but you look up to somebody in their work, and then you meet them in person, and they're a complete douchebag, and you're like, ah. Yeah, I'm, I'm that for people sometimes. But <laughs> you know, that was me when when I was a kid. You read about people, and it, there wasn't yeah. social media, and you looked up to people, and then you would meet them in real life, and you're like, man, God, this guy's a douche. You know? Yeah. <laughs> It, it's hard, so. right? I, I think I think what's hard about that because I got to defend myself a little bit on that one. Um, it's hard to always. You never know what people expect of you, mm. and you never know what they're. What is? What are they trying to gain out of this interaction, right? And so, to me, I have a. You know, I don't. I, I'm one of those guys that like in the right setting, I'll I'll talk your ear off and tell you everything in the world you want to know. Anything I any knowledge I have is is like public record at yeah. that point, right? But it's it's always the setting, right? Like if I'm you know if I'm out here drinking, trying to get like disconnect from that world, I don't know how you know how conversive I can be in that space, yeah. you know? Like yeah. that that that's what they say. It's like you know they assume that because you have followers that you're famous, but you have everything but the thing that fame typically brings, which is income. Yeah. Right. So I have to work just as much as the next guy. I just have a few followers on Instagram, which yep. today's like today means nothing com considering, you know, what people are doing now on social media. I mean, yeah, our, I think my numbers would be great in like 14. Yeah. You know what I mean? 2014, <laughs> I'd have been a celebrity dude yeah. straight up, but now yeah. it's kind of like, eh, it's about yeah. average. I know. But, you know, so the, uh, some people feel like, oh, well, you know, you're at this point where so you're you got to be available for this. And I'm like, well, if it'd be different if I was sitting at a show and my job was to converse with you mm -hmm. walking by every time. But it's, I don't know. I don't know how to be everything everybody in the world wants me to be all the time. You it's know, tough. you know, the, you can't be everything to everyone. Yeah. Especially customers, too. You know. I, oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I try and be nice to everybody that I meet as far as and answering questions and everything but it does get a little sometimes you got to tell them like hey i'm just i'm not dinner with my my girlfriend man. yeah yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> um i don't know i think you gotta it's an art form in itself is, is trying to figure out that because creative people we don't know we didn't go to school for that we didn't yeah. have a coach like like professional athletes that teach them how to talk in public yeah like, there's none of that yeah you know what i mean there's just you're trying to figure it out on your own half of it is trying to forget all the shit you learn how to say in a body shop that's inappropriate yeah. in in the world of yeah. especially nowadays you know i remember i worked in a body shop and uh i was probably i was probably 13 and this guy that was like the shop clown yeah pulled me aside and he's like you want to be a good body man and i'm like i guess you know um and he opened up the flat drawer of his toolbox and he had a two lines of crank and he did them both in front of me and i never knew what the hell it was yeah and i was like whoa and i went to the boss i said i don't want to work over here anymore so he put me in the other shop yeah but you know that type of stuff in the body shop was like uh that mentality too of just it's just a lot different nowadays you know oh, yeah a lot of the the politi politically incorrect stuff that we were brought up with you couldn't get away with nowadays, no you know? and i mean dude starting this podcast i had to relearn how to you know some things that we would say that was like more or less a positive yeah. thing yeah. it doesn't sound positive if you sound clip it you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah. so that was a lot of relearning and retooling if you will yeah but you know the the other thing is like i'm i'm a I, sh I talk shit. That's my thing. I love to talk shit. And I love being around people that can jump back, back because that's what we had to do. I, I grew up playing basketball, which oh. you had to be able to talk shit. Yeah, that's huge. And then I grew Any up in sport. a body shop. Yeah. Any sport. Yeah. The shop that I grew or I kind of cut my teeth in and custom paint was all about shit talking mm -hmm. each other. So sometimes when I get out around people, my, you know, especially people that don't know me and I start playing a little bit of that personality then yeah. they take that as like oh he's an asshole i'm like no dude that was a joke that you obviously didn't get yeah you know because once again like what were you trying to gain out of this situation you know i always think about that like when i see somebody i'm at born free or i'm at so and so i'm like man like I, I need to go say something to this guy but i also gotta ask myself why yeah do i want him to know me or do i want to know him 
then sometimes that's well, a thing, you're right? You're overthinking it, maybe. Oh, I'm an overthinker too, too yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying what's up to people, but for sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember I worked in a shop. Back to the shit talking thing that you were telling, talking about is, I worked in a shop where it was a group. Of, I was the youngest guy by ten years in the Total shop. Pole. And I would, it was like, people would come in and be like, "What is wrong with you guys?" Because we would start at nine and we work till two in the morning, but you'd walk in and we'd be shit talking from across the <laughs> shop, and there'd be tape balls throwing at each other, and there'd be bottle rockets getting tossed under the bathroom if yep. you're in there. I remember one time I was in the bathroom and a, a, a heel dolly, you know, a hammer yeah. dolly, came flying through the wall into the bathroom. I mean, it was just chaos. Yeah. You know, but that's what we did to maintain our workload. Yep. Because yep. we talked shit to each other to pass the time. Imagine if we were all just sitting there saying nothing. Mm. I mean, you would be That'd driving be yourself insane. Yeah. I remember one time we put weed in the guy's burger, one of the older <laughs> body guys there. And he uh, had a ha- he started having heart competitions. <laughs> and he, he had to go to the hospital, and we felt so bad. We were like, "Oh man, like this guy's gonna die." <laughs> and his wife and the, he's there, and they couldn't figure it out why he was having these heart problems. And it, it just he was high. Yeah. And he came back like a couple of days later. And he's like, "Man, this is now we had to sit him down and go, dude, sorry, we put weed in your cheeseburger." <laughs> 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 it was just like oh he was so mad he left for like a month for real oh yeah yeah he was yeah. so mad should do like ecstasy or something like that in there well <laughs> so, that wasn't a thing back then oh, i mean shit. i didn't even know what you know i've never even seen ecstasy before but you know it wasn't a thing back then i think it might have been like a thing that you did at the raves, the raves. And shit. Yeah. yeah 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 no i that like i said those things that would take place in shops you know uh I remember, I remember the shop that I worked at when I first worked there, and he was kind of giving me the lay of the shit talking. Yeah. He said something about like, "Hey, when we start making jokes about banging your old lady, that's when we, you know, we like you." Well, that's the thing. Yeah. You know, if if they're not talking shit to you, it means there's something wrong. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. like you don't you're not fitting into yeah. that little world. Yeah. And so, I mean, to be honest with you, like that's what I grew up with, and then when my little brother was coming up in the shop, it was maybe not as hardcore as that, but a, a version of that. Yeah. And it just put him in a therapy, <laughs> straight up. <laughs> He's well, like, it's a generational thing of thick skin. And yeah, I think the new generation just doesn't have it. You know, they take but, everything literal. You know, I always looked at it like, uh, you know, n- from this point looking back, and I, I try to say this to my daughter and stuff. You know, coming into a workplace, you instead of coming in and preaching about how they should treat you, you got to learn how to get in line with how things are working there and then work your way into a spot of leadership or lead or change. Right. Well, that's part of like reading people. I think people nowadays don't know how to read people. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's all about themselves. Mm. And it's like, I know you've heard it. The loudest one in the room is the weakest. Yep. And like you see people like, I can't, it just makes me cringe thinking about it. It's like they're the loud guy that comes into the bar at, born free or something we dealt with one of those on this road trip and you're like man just you know that you know that guy's just dealing with yeah dealing with some insecurities or something in in his own thing but yeah what happened on your road trip oh we were at a hotel bar in uh, moab and Mm. this over the top dressed country guy who Uh, was not country was it a cosplay cowboy I would say so. Yeah, yeah he was, yeah, and he are, was like, "I'm from Texas," fun. and we're like, "We're from Texas." <laughs> <laughs> we look like this <laughs> and shit. And he's like uh, loud, and he's like trying to buy expensive bottles of wine, but then he's looking it up to see what it's like. He just everything is projecting, yeah, you know. And it's like things that doesn't need to be said yep. or doesn't need to be out there. Yep. Um, and it was just, it was awkward. It made at first we didn't really like the bartender, but then we felt sorry for the bartender and kind of befriended him a little bit and once the guy kind of went away it's like we get it like you deal with that shit all day long yeah. i'm not going to take whatever little small transgression we had earlier yeah. and apply that to you so. we get a lot of that here because we're, it's a you know the wine country thing oh, and yeah. you get a lot of these people that come traveling and you guys got the you know the dick measuring competition with the wallets at the bar and you see these guys and i don't really go out too much anymore but i enjoy going to places that you know are wine and wine tasting and all that stuff you know call it what you want but um around here and and uh you get these people that come in you're just like ah man you don't have to be this way yeah (laughs) like you don't have to be that guy that you know like brags about how much money he's making or 
this or that or blah 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 and it's like uh it just makes me cringe it's not how i was i've never been that way you yeah know? um and it's very self center ish you know yes yeah, yeah. and well, you just like you, you just notice it because it it sucks up the uh it's it sucks up whatever energy that's more yeah. positive out of the room yeah it's you weird. know it's it's just not my style at all i've never been that way and i think you know with the sometimes people expect that because you're some quote unquote famous on Instagram. When yeah. you like go to a motorcycle show, they like expect you to be this egotistical person. That, yeah. And I'm like this humble, like quiet guy and they want you to be that. And I don't know if you've experienced it. So they almost get frustrated with you when they talk to you. They're just like, it's all about Tell me them. more. Yeah. They're all about them. And then I need this from you. And you're like, sorry, man, I'm just, I'm just yeah. chilling, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think that, that's been a struggle of mine over the years is trying to figure out like who, not who to be, but like how to operate in those, those situations, because it's kind of uh it's kind of egotistical or pretentious to start feeling like when you get these places that you're at a place that need where you need to preach. Mm. And I've definitely been in that place where I felt like I needed to before, Yeah. but, and kind of leading up to this moment now or the last couple of weeks, like I'm, I've decided like I want to be in more everywhere I go be more of a, a learning state mm -hmm. a constantly like absorbing less projecting you know what I mean yeah um yeah. which is hard because there's certain things I feel pretty you know like I feel like I have something that might help you with this I, I feel like I should say it yeah versus but at the same time you know that's also goes back to that whole thing of like well you know they didn't ask me mm -hmm. you know so yeah. why 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 project yourself into that spot without the invite i'm learning as i get older that like almost not saying something and maybe it's because i've learned this through teaching is like almost a good way of teaching is not to teach yeah them something and to watch them experience a mistake in front of you and mm. then pick up the slack and tell them how to fix it i've learned that in like a social environment as well okay where you're just uh you know you less if you if you don't say anything it's almost better you mm. know um people almost take you the wrong way when you come out like you were saying and, and you want to tell them yeah. something you know um what's well, also like you know uh, along the lines of the teaching thing i feel like i feel like as as a, a person who had to find a way to teach myself a lot of things yep. you 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 always hit these roadblocks and like you were saying, like you see when they get to that spot where they, you can be more service yeah. or they can ask you the right question to you to give them an answer. Like I've always used this analogy. So my listeners, I'm sorry, but if I came here as not a custom painter said, Hey Taylor, how do I do gold leaf? Yeah. That's a big loaded question. I mean, that's a broad statement. Exactly. Too. Yeah. And, but if I said, Hey man, you know, when you're doing leaf and you get to this one spot and this happens, how do you solve that issue? Like what's, is it a pre thing? Is it a during thing or is it what? That's a much more, it shows me a, you've already done the work yeah. and put in the time. And you're at a point now where some simple, I, I just one more stone makes this whole thing go together for you. I have a lot of, of students when I teach classes that I'll teach them one little thing. And they always, I've had multiple people at multiple classes say this that was worth the money to come here. Yeah, yeah. That was worth my time to be here. That mm -hmm. one little thing of learning how to do that one little easier step of doing something. Yeah. And they go, that's worth it. Exactly. That's worth, my, that's worth me being here, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's exactly how it was for me. Like, when I would uh, get a chance to, you know, I never, I never really, YouTube for custom paint was never a thing for uh, me growing up. And that's a whole different and I, I, like I said, not to knock the people that are doing that, but at, at, in a way, like, in a way, there's more, there's so many ways to skin a cat, right? And some are more skipping certain things that are important versus others. It's like, you know, like I would say, like, to learn how to custom paint a helmet, there's the way you're going to approach doing this helmet versus me. Mm -hmm. There's kind of probably some places we're in line with and some other places we're going to vary. Yeah. Um, I think there's that extreme and then there's the uh, the the on the spectrum of that there's that and then there's the whole other side of it where 
somebody is learning from YouTube the completely wrong way to do it. Yeah. With the complete wrong products. With the, I tell people every time I teach is like I have to deprogram people from YouTube University yeah. because they've learned so many bad techniques that I almost prefer people when they come to my class to not even know yeah. that type of stuff. <laughs> like if they're complete beginners, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's really tough because I've had cust uh, customers, I've had students that even at the end of the class are still uh, used pushing to that. towards that YouTube stuff because that's all they've known is sitting at their house watching YouTube and then doing mm -hmm. it, right? And um, for them, it's it's hard to like absorb yeah. what you're teaching them because they're so used to that. And maybe it's the learning platform. Yeah. Or maybe it's the, um, you know, people learn differently. Some people are three-dimensional learners. Some people yeah. are, are readers. Some people are, you know, that type yeah. of stuff. Um, but it's been a, a struggle because you'll see people blossom throughout the three-day class. They start out struggling. And then by the end of the weekend, you see them create this amazing piece. Mm -hmm. And they walk away and you know that that person is going to be a custom painter. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see people that are just still struggling throughout the whole weekend, kind of give up a little bit through the halfway through. Yeah. They're just sitting there watching everybody else. You try and motivate them to do stuff and they just. Do you ever ask them like, like what, you know, this is maybe like I was telling you, like some of the things that I want to do in the class thing is more the verbal, like getting the headspace right. Cause I feel like there's a headspace you got to have to be in this world. Well, we start like, out each class with a description of product overview you know, questions going in, introduction of myself. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I'm not a public speaker. Yeah. But like I've developed into one mm -hmm. because you have to be, right? So. Um, First time where you kind of like shaking, a little nervous? A little. No, I wasn't shaking nervous. <laughs> I was just more excited to get it out of the way and oh, just start yeah, yeah. working. And then you'll see that people, because they come in, they don't know me. They don't know the shop. They don't know the layout, they're comfortable with their little space in the shop at their table. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're doing. So by the second day, you see the complete different change in everybody. Mm -hmm. You'll see everybody kind of gel. Everybody kind of finds their little tribes in the, in the classroom. And you'll see everybody kind of like blossom a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then by the third day, you see really good relationships because at that point, people have gone out to dinner together. I've yeah. taken people the whole class out to dinner one time. And all that type of stuff. So you see everybody kind of click together. And I've had, uh, um, I forget her name, but she was like crying at the end of the class because she was so happy about how, she was so nervous in the beginning and then she was so stoked oh, at nice, the end. Nice. So she was like crying at the end. She's like, I don't want this to be over, you know? <laughs> um, so you get a lot of that, but it's first day jitters for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, and it's, you get a lot of, um, sometimes you get very, people that are just there for the wrong reasons too. Yeah. You know, they're there um, to promote themselves and to like show the rest of the class, this is what I do. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and I always tell people, it's like, I'm an equal of you guys here. This is your opportunity to ask me everything. Don't be afraid to tell me what you're thinking, what you're feeling, if you need more attention, if you're stuck, you know, so the whole time by the end of the weekend i'm usually lost my voice because i'm talking yeah. and going around everybody all weekend mm. you know and you're exhausted you know but i love it i love the showing people the end product and you know carrying them along and dragging them across the finish line sometimes <laughs> do you uh do you get this question a lot and if so like how how do you kind of answer it like people that are just looking to like have their own thing, their own style, their own creativity or how they tap into their own creativity. You ever get that kind of, a lot of people are floating mm -hmm. and they're bouncing around and, and you'll notice a lot of those people are, are mimicking a lot of other painters. Mm -hmm. I like what this guy did. I want to do this on my board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they haven't found that style yet. Yeah. I had a, a student that he's been to like three or four of my classes. He's a painter for Boeing in Washington. He paints okay. all the um, huge jets. Yeah. <clears throat> and he kind of came in that way where he kind of didn't have his own style, was just kind of like mimicking a lot of what the things that are happening now yeah. with the panel paint jobs. He was just doing a lot of the techniques and that, which is fine. And now he's developed into this custom painter that has his own style. Mm. And that was like, I felt like a proud dad, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Because you saw him kind of lost 
and then creative person, but then he found a style and now he's blossoming and now you can't stop him. Mm. I think he's changed roles at Boeing and he's painting more at his home studio up there. You talking about a uh, Finnish FX, uh, Steven? No. No, oh. he's in uh, Southern. Or he's yeah, because he was doing the airplane Fresno thing too, or something. I think. Uh, like Palmdale or some shit. I thought he was like like Tehachapi. Is, I went and had dinner with him once oh. in Tehachapi. So, yeah. but yeah, it's um, you know, I I feel like dude, if you're painting jets and you got that gig, that's probably <laughs> better. Better, uh, yeah. I don't know. That's probably got more lucrative like uh benefits yeah i mean he takes care of his family and that's how he pays his bills but i mean you can only spray a jet so many times before i I think that if i would have been if i was in that space of having that normal job and i got to come do this for the fun of it instead of the work of it Mm. that would probably be different for me too you know what i mean well you and i talked about it as like trying to i get a lot of now i get a lot of um you know, satis- satisfying feeling, I guess you could say, as as painting a helmet that I have that I bought new or from mm-hmm. Simpson or something, and then I paint it whatever I feel like. Yeah. And then I put it out there, and somebody buys it. Yeah. And cutting the customer and the consultations and the updates and the mm-hmm. all that stuff out, and just producing something and just putting it out there. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm leaning more towards that. That's where my direction of where I'm going with a lot of stuff. Yeah, that that seems like the the like a natural progression for art. Yeah. Right? Like get away from commissions. <laughs> yeah. I mean if you really think about it, like even though and I, I've been preaching this for years now, but you know, like I think custom paint has been a commodity for a long time and if we don't sell it as art, then it's always gonna be there's no difference between this thing that's on this right here and a Bassani exhaust. And if that's the way your the 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 clientele is treating yeah. what you're creating, then you feel like a product on a shelf mm-hmm. and then you get treated like a product on yeah. the shelf, right? And I always have this, like, I envision this thing in my mind of having custom paint at, like, the MoMA. Or yeah, a, yeah. Or, a, you know, a, a art exhibit to exhibit it as art instead of custom paint. hmm You know, and... um you know, getting back to a lot of the history of custom painting. So I just filmed, um, we started filming a series with Hot Bike Magazine. Yeah. It's called The History of Custom Painting. Mm -hmm. And it's me going around interviewing custom painters that a lot of people don't, that are younger, don't even know started techniques in existed that are the reason why they're doing what they are doing as a young custom painter. So we just started filming... um, we just did Andy Me down at Flying Irons. We yeah, just talked yeah. to him and his history. So we have a few other ones that we're going to do, film nice. and do some stuff. But it's like a web series that we're doing with the Hot Bike Magazine. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. Yeah, Andy's a badass painter, man. Yeah, Flying and he's a Iron. humble guy. Yeah. I haven't had him on the podcast yet because where he's kind of located, it's always like more or less off the beaten path. And I've every time I'm around, it's like, fuck, bad timing. <laughs> yeah. But I've always – his his work is so clean, man, I you know? know? So. Yeah. And he does it all from big ass cars yes. to, you know, which is what we talked about is, you know, and we talked about the work life balance with him too and yeah. all that stuff and who inspired him and who's continuing to inspire him and all that other stuff. And that's yeah. what it's about. It's about giving these young painters a true North of what it is that made them who they are without them even knowing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So these guys like David Perowitz and all that stuff, like he's an OG flame guy that mm-hmm. people don't even know that's part of the techniques of why yep. overlapping flames are like the way they are, you yeah. know, like stuff like that. So, um, it's a pretty exciting and it's, it's a, a way of me kind of, I don't know, I guess teaching on a different plane of showing people that. Yeah, there's, no, that's good. We, more. we need more of that kind of stuff because, you know, one, I think that one thing that people don't do, and I, I try to, I'm, I'm currently trying to do this more is to, uh, is, I've always been a guy like, look, I if I'm inspired by something, I always make that like a part of the post or a part yeah, of yeah. The, the the story, right? And the thing is, it's like there's nothing worse than seeing, which I know this has happened to you, seeing someone who oh, verbatim will take your paint job oh, yeah. and <laughs> put it out there. And next thing you know, the, the Dyna repost pages are glorifying this job that's literally an exact copy of, you know, to the T of something you've done. Yeah. And... You know, it's one of those weird things where, like, uh, 
like I'm I'm flattered by it for the most part, but at the same time, like I I just it would just probably not matter. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. I can't yeah. gain anything from it or or whatever. But sometimes just saying like, look, man, like I I love this paint job so much. This guy did one. I you know maybe I'm at a level where you know this is all I know how to do. But yeah. it, it blows my mind how some people can like. And this is another difference I think that maybe you can expand on is. Some people have all the techniques, but they have no vision. And the vision is yes. the other part of yes. being a custom painter that gets overlooked. Or that's the opposite. They have all the vision and none of the techniques. Yeah. And that goes yeah. back to the foundation part. Exactly. Um, I recently had a, a Harley dealership in Germany. I guess it's not recent. It's been a couple of years or so. But blatantly copy full on the paint job that yeah. I did a month before. I think, it's, I, think I know which one because I think they did it to me too. And... Uh, it was a I did like a Dixon flannel mm. inspired like pattern inside of a, a paint job and it was like gold leaf and charcoal and all this other stuff and uh, a couple months later here's this um, I think it was a I don't know what bike model it was but it was the exact paint job yeah and that was the one time I messaged somebody and said hey man like I understand like you like my paint job but this is an exact copy yeah and he sent me back this paragraph. You inspire us to do this, and I was like, so "Dude, I love the inspiration." Yeah, but don't exactly take what I did and copy it per, verbatim, or yeah. you know. And uh, it was—I didn't even know. Like that was the one time that I was like, "Come on," you yeah. know. And there's been like Nick's gold bike. There's been so many copies yeah. of that. Well, when Thailand, I did, and, and there was one that was at Sturgis that was like, when, uh, I don't know what year it was, but it was like. Uh, a complete copy, but it wasn't candies. It was just all just base. basis. And everybody well, was walking up going, oh, there's Nick's bike. And it was like, not Nick's bike. So, <laughs> so you know, same thing. Like, you know, my gold FXR gets mistaken for that one a lot, even mm -hmm. though it's the same pagan gold. But th when we first did that bike, you know, it in, in the ways that I could, I, you know, hey, this was the true north. This was the inspiration. Well, that's inspiration. Yeah. Right? That's not copying. Um, the, the bad part is like when the people see that bike, they assume that it, that's the bike and that that's my paint job. Yeah. When it's not. Yeah. And so the quality may not exactly. be there. And so I get it tied to that. And yeah. It's like when, you know, assumptions. When those Chinese companies were knocking off Ness and PM and they were oh, selling yeah. those parts and they were lesser quality aluminum. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. You know, but that's kind of the thing is like, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always tried to be very open and vocal about where anything that I create comes from. And there, whether it's like a, a, a paint trick that I got from this guy or or a color scheme that I got from another guy, you yeah. know, and it's 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 I mean, it, it, it as a painter, as, as an established painter, sometimes it feels uh, how do you say like you want to feel like you can create that on your own. Right. But how many, I mean, think about how many customers come to you. Uh, you've always been really known for having like your color palettes are unique to you. Mm. That's one of the things I would say, like stand you apart from a lot of other painters that you bring colors together that are, for me, I don't see them until I see it on your well, job. Yeah, if you were going to say, Hey, I would yeah. put, uh, you know, teal brown orange and off-white with some pearl in it you'd be like what? yeah you know but um i mean those the the two most like iconic and honestly like if i had I, I feel like i've told you before but the 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 teal breeze the one with the gold in it that was on oh shit i've done uh, about five paint jobs yeah that so that bike and that gold fxr when i first got into the panel game like those which, were my which teal breeze were you? I were, I think it was the one. It had the gold in it, but it was like the one they used in the House of Color ad a long oh, time ago. Yeah, it, was it had the, the question, question mark. mark. Yeah. yeah, we just. Uh, I did a bike recently for Richie, who rides with Unknown now, and he wanted to do that again. Yeah, on, on the tank. See, those, to me, one. those like in the early days of this Dyna culture and the panel game stuff. Even though panels obviously were around forever, but in this wave of it, if you will, yeah. like I find those two bikes to be. And, and a few more that you've done to kind of be the, like, the OG kind of trendsetter of that kind of thing. Well, you know? I'm not, like, somebody that brags, but I feel like a lot of people tell me that that's what set this off. Yeah, you know, 100%. It's, it's yeah. those bikes. And, um, you know, a lot now is, is um, I thought, you know, if somebody's going to copy some of my patterns that I do, like my 
stencil inlays. Yeah. I might as well just make the stencils and, and sell, sell them myself yeah. because they're going to, you know, try and copy it anyway. So that's what I've been doing. Um, but the, yeah, the, the, watch the evolution of it. And I feel like the, um, the industry right now is there's a lot of people searching, throwing stuff up against the wall and seeing what sticks right now. I don't know yeah, if you feel yeah. that way. Like there's not a lot of things that are coming out swinging, right? That was the, the last wave that we had that was a huge I mean, think about what we were coming off of, though. Like, if you think about the styles of custom paint. The realistic fire and the skulls and the, I'm going to do realistic fire with traditional flames. Yeah, yeah. So all those things are the, that's that's the world I came from where I, you know, wanted to get to this point of being the best at that. And then, dude, I remember it was probably 2012 when I started seeing a little uh, panel job here and there. Oh, yeah. Well, Instagram came out in, what, 11? Yeah. So that's what really. So. And it wasn't so much like, like I said, obviously, if you really deep dive in custom paint panels of, you know, the Always whole thing has been around. Right. Yeah. And whatnot. But I started kind of it started coming across like the different feeds or the magazines that I had read. And I just like I was like, man, that looks too easy because it, in a sense, like in, at least the way I see it is back then I'm doing these intricate tribal things that are like knotted up and Celtic. Yeah. And then I got, you know, this dude's wife with some hotter girl's body yeah, yeah. and you know real fire and a dragon and like yeah. i'm all this i'm like this shit is, i'm doing this fucking like hard yeah and so i kind of resisted for years like to do the path and um my friend brad that we took a picture together at yeah, my shop yeah. I know brad. he was the one that was uh dude you got to do this you got like he's probably a bigger fan of you than me which <laughs> fucking fuck you brad uh but <laughs> He kept pushing like the Simpsons. He kept pushing the panels. And then when I, you know, I finally like took the plunge, you know, it was hard because I had felt like I had established myself a, a somewhat of a style in a different style of paint. So it was almost like a, f at first I looked at it like a daunting task to reinvent myself. Mm. But then I found like in the simplicity of taking a shape and carving out a few different shapes within the shape. Yeah. I started finding ways of bringing other things into it that I had done in other paint jobs, like the airbrush, yeah. not saying it hadn't yeah. been done before, but it was just different in a sense. And even though, like, if you look at some of the first helmets I've ever done and the evolution of where they're at now, they look nothing like that anymore. Well, but it's yeah. now I feel like I have a style within this world that's unique to me, yep. but different than you, different than Poland, different than Jeremy, different mm -hmm. from the more or less guys that would be my direct, yeah. if I looked at it as competition, that would yeah. be that, you know, yeah. but. And I guess for me, like uh, early on organically, what happened was, is I was working in a shop that I was just talking about yeah. where we had a bunch of guys that we would shit talk and everything. And being the youngest person and coming up, trying to be creative and yeah. pushing myself is, that we were doing paint jobs like Realistic Fire and every paint job was flamed. You know, yeah. so I got really good at doing flames. I got sick of them. Mm -hmm. So when I would do stuff like I did that snowboard over there yeah. at that shop and I was trying to find a style, you know, kind of floating around. I always looked up the low riders and I always did all the stuff yeah. and I always like found this, but they would make fun of me <laughs> all the time because yeah. it wasn't what they were doing. They didn't think it was cool. And that just like drove me even more. Yeah. And it drove me to, um, get out of that shop and do my own thing mm. and the red i remember the first bike i did for unknown was the red fxr for buddy mm -hmm. super simple but the thing about the simple panel paint jobs is that every single person whether it's a painter or your grandma mm -hmm. can tell if that line is crooked yeah or if this is off mm -hmm. or this is this i remember we would do these intricate tear away paint jobs and baggers back in the day yep. and you could hide so much stuff yep. in there <laughs> you, know? you know and they would yeah. stripe them they would have the mini truck yep. the little slash thing slash yeah. striping you know so you could hide a lot in those paint jobs whereas like a panel paint job it's there it's right in your face yeah you know and and i always tell my students like you got to less is more and you you don't want to just because you know how to do everything doesn't mean you need to do everything yeah you know, mm -hmm. and you see a lot of that nowadays is where there's a fine line between a good co color combination and an Easter egg. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So a lot of these guys are coming out and they're trying to, they're not trying to do something creative. They're just doing it to do it. 
Yeah. And they're they're putting everything that I'm just going to do everything I know and just spew it onto a helmet. Mm. It's like I felt like there was a there was a, a wave where even even for myself where the simplicity of like less is more has always seemed to attract a higher clientele than Absolutely. than a, a you know a Absolutely. wild crazy Easter egg and so finding that balance of of where to stop where where to continue it's kind of like understanding the the canvas you're working on as well well it kind of gets back to the idea of the loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room yeah so you get a lot of people that go and they get these crazy paint jobs and you know that they're doing it as an insecurity of uh, what, what they're doing they yeah. want to be the guy you know they want to i want everything on this bike and i want to yeah. be i'm compensating for myself you yeah know? where it's like the guy that's like hey man i want this clean i want it to be cool i want it to be timeless i want it to be able to yeah you know and that's the guys that you're like really hone in on you mm. know well it's it's also i guess maybe on a different like wavelength here it's like getting so used to painting dinas fxrs and then soft tails and baggers now and then now it's like the fxr scene is all about you know factory looking stuff yeah, i and mean i got one right behind us that so we're doing a factory i mean luckily it's a clean thing we're just yeah clearing some pieces but we're factory matching some stuff yeah so you get that coming into it and then you know um you know baggers i, I feel like they're still a, a good market but it's like the race graphic style has yeah. kind of you know it's starting to come in it's like you had mentioned a while ago like what is more or less a new thing or like a new trend that's coming and i, I feel like i don't I, I i mean i try not to think about it too much i just yeah. try to do what feels good but i mean do you feel like there's something i get clients that are asking me to do this performance bagger nascar helmet kind of feel to yeah. uh their bikes right now um and you know i'm fine with it whatever it is um people are trying to get away from less like low rider style and more into that but incorporating yeah. the two i guess you could say so i don't know i feel like custom painting right now in the motorcycle industry is really reflecting our country as in a whole and the economy mm. and everything else is really coming through yeah before it was never like that you know like 2008 and all that stuff people were real pretty rocking and rolling yeah. with their motorcycle still Right now, I feel like the economy and everything's really starting to come through and bleeding into the motorcycle world. Yeah. You know? And I think the reflection of that is that there's no real big trends going on. Mm. You know? Everybody's kind of stagnant. Everybody's just idling. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, like, with how the industry of motorcycle industry has kind of changed from, you know, more or less one-off things to, you know, and I'm not talking shit about this, but, like, all the products that are on sale, you know, like, every every other Instagram post by every other brand is a, uh, you know, click to buy yeah. to the online store. And, you know, I think that like, there's not a lot of, uh, there's, there's no reason to innovate. No. You know, it, it still kills me to this day when I hear people call themselves or people refer to people as bike builders when they're mm. they have a stock bike. Yeah. You know, like you rebuilt the bike. You customize it as well. I like to say it. it. Yeah. Yeah. But you're not a bike builder. Yeah. You know, a bike builder was the guys like Jesse James that were making frames. Yeah. You know, and, and those guys, you know, those were bike builders. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that term gets used so loosely, and I yeah. think it gets kind of bestowed upon people through different organizations. Like, we've got invited builder here and here and here. Yeah. And I, it's one of those things that I think it's an honor for anybody to hear it about themselves. But the reality is that 90% of what, I think our industry is is customization yes, as opposed to yeah. uh you know building yeah. you know like yeah. assembling you know um or modifying yeah. but none of those words kind of carry the moniker that a builder does no. you know no. and i don't know it's it's a tough one you know because i i like the uh i think that the for me in my evolution the goal is to get to a point where i can create more of those things like that's that's what inspires me i want to I mean, maybe maybe in this lifetime, but maybe not. Like, yeah, I want to push towards getting to a point where I can make a frame or take a frame and completely change it yeah. in a different way. But, you know, uh, I don't know. It's it's tough. Like, uh, it's tough when you're, like, trying to nail down what the motorcycle industry is and where it's going well, and how it's going to be. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, where, where's it going to – is the chopper scene going to come back? 
I feel you know, like is it this is. gonna happen? Is this gonna happen? Nobody knows right now. Everybody's everybody's idling, and um, I feel like everybody's kind of waiting. You know, waiting to see what happens. Oh, a hundred percent. That's know? I mean, you know, everybody knows that Harley's probably releasing the newer models this yeah. in a few weeks. Um, and with then that, you see the competitiveness between them and Indian right now. It's, yeah, it's insane. So, and I mean, which is good for like innovation, you yeah. know. But you know, with with the the thing is like with the baggers, right? Like, if you were to do, and I know you've done some like all out baggers, like paint jobs for these guys, and you know, what these guys will have in these bikes, and then you know, um, you know whether you know the the goal is like it, to build something for you, not with the intention of like, okay, how much is this worth? Can I sell it for eighty thousand dollars? Right? I mean, you never get what you put into a bike. Yeah. You know, never. but it feels like this today, right now, like it's hard to get. It's hard to get what. I don't know. It's hard to get, you know, a few dollars over what it would be new right. with, you know, something that would literally it might cost you $70,000, $80,000 to buy and build that bike. And you're trying to get 35 grand for it. Yeah. And it's I'm like, struggling to get that. I just feel like people are, <laughs> they're not, I don't know. Like, and I feel like when people, when industries get to that point where there's no, there's no profitability in building, selling, starting over. Yeah. then that's when I think that it kind of like pff, falls on its face. And I wouldn't say that, that like uh, the soft tail market, I feel like is pretty good. It's been good for us in, in, in the Midwest and yeah. Texas and whatnot, but I don't know how it is out here, but we're pretty snagged out here. You know, everything starts, I feel like out here and then it goes East. Right. Yeah. So, um, I don't, you know, I feel like it's pretty stagnant. To be yeah. With you. I think that it's, it's kind of waiting. It's mm. not really, there's no, nothing's really i don't know at least me personally nothing's really catching my eyes for yeah. like something that's cool and, and coming out you know dude i've you know it's no secret for my listeners but i've gone down and i've been drinking the chopper kool-aid so bad lately <laughs> you know and it's it's not it's not for the aesthetic of being a chopper guy it's it's like the the things that like doing that fxr chopper if you will there was no box hmm of no no trend thing that I needed to stay within no no uh you know okay well you know what's the three exhaust choices what's the three seat manufacturers yeah, like no. it was more of like I want this to look this way and how do I make it look that way and let me get it's more creating making yeah. things like yeah. there was a platform that was you know the baseline of it but it was so freeing and so inspiring to do that versus like uh how I felt recently, you know, all right, I got a bagger. Well, I've already figured out what is the perfect kit for the way I ride. So it's hard to deviate from that, yeah. you know? So when you're building a custom bike, you're, you're kind of like right now with the FXR, I'm filling out what's the, what's the kit, what's the vibe. And you know, the evolution of where things have started, right? So back in the day, there wasn't a good seat that you can wheelie on. Yeah. Now you can go buy a seat and it's like perfect. Wheel perfect. Seat. Yeah there wasn't an exhaust so you built your own exhaust now there's 10 exhausts you know yeah. you can go pick from you know so um maybe it's a saturation of too many choices right now that's yeah. making the industry stagnant and i always felt like more choice would would more choices would bring more uh like expandability or more diversity in the builds but it feels like they're all still within the same definitely yeah, I get. I haven't been to a bike show since before COVID, I think, and or no, I went to the one moto, and for me, it's it's just there's nothing really that just makes me go, Damn, yeah, you know, anymore. Yeah, yeah. And nothing that's like, oh shit, look at this. He did this. He did that. He did that. Look at this. It's like I don't really get that anymore. Mm. Back in the day, you'd see a bike and you'd be like, man, look at this, gold hammer front end and this and that, and you're just like, wow. Now it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like the kit, I feel like the setup now is to get you a nice dialed, you know, FXR, Dyna, Softail, something like, something in that sub $20,000 category so you don't feel like you've got too much money in it or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. then, like, build something. Build something for real. Like, yeah. you know, you got your ripper, your rider, something that you can ride, but take your time and build something like amazing you know whether it's a chopper or a crazy bagger or whatever maybe, the case maybe that's the thing maybe choppers are coming back maybe <coughs> that's that's the thing i don't know i don't really know yeah i just i don't know i just keep painting yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so 
you know, like, I remember for a while you were kind of thinking about getting out of Cali. Is it still? I never not stopped thinking about moving out of here. Yeah. Um, what people don't really understand about California is that there's such an appeal with the environment, mm-hmm. the climate. You know, from my shop now, we could drive 10 minutes down the road and see 1,000, 1,200-year-old redwoods. Mm. And if we drive another 10, 15 minutes, we'll be at the beach. Yeah. And then we could turn around and drive two hours and go to the snow and go snowboarding. Yeah. And then we can, you know, so in one day, you can go surf in the morning and go snowboard in the afternoon. Yeah. And go drink wine or go to the Golden Gate Bridge, all within this area, right? Yeah. But now it's such a reflection of people capitalizing on that to where they know that this is a desirable area now. Mm -hmm. So the expenses are just through the roof, right? And when you're in it, when you're in the mix is what a lot of people don't understand about California. That if you live outside of California is that when you're in it, when you're in California, you don't realize it. Yeah. Until you leave. And then you realize like, wow, I'm in a rat race. Yeah. You know, I'm grinding every day just to pay bills. Well, or I could probably move somewhere else, get a bigger house, more property, and work less and be happier. Yeah. But not be around all the climate and environmental things. Yeah, that we you have, have to vacation to that. You know what yeah. I mean? So, um, you know, I'm a, I love firearms and I love hunting and I love fishing and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's changed a lot since I was a kid in that aspect. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's been a lot. It's been harder yeah to do those things growing up you know third fourth generation of per- people that hunt and fish to do it now it's almost it's difficult because there's so many regulations i'm not saying i'm a poacher or anything like that i yeah. follow all those rules but it's like man I, what they, they almost like take advantage of the fact that you want to do that here yeah it's like i gotta buy a license with these stamps and i gotta get an extra stamp for sturgeon fishing and i gotta get this duck stamp for this and i gotta do this and yeah. i gotta buy these tags and oh i need to get that and so it's like what's the point of like are you really hunting for like the traditional means of food and things like that or, cause it'd be cheaper just to go buy a steak somewhere yeah and so the you know our family has been that way forever but um at what point is it like, man, I can go move to Idaho and or somewhere and yeah. buy a license and register my car once, Yeah, you know, instead of every year you have to pay <laughs> all this money to register your car. But, you know, and then you look at the hindsight and you're like, well, it's absolutely beautiful here. You have all these things to do. Um, you just have to tolerate the people. Yeah. You know, and um, it's been tough. It's a, it's a hard thing. Um, you know, being a... a tattooed white male that owns a business here it's pretty tough yeah you know yeah. so um a lot of people stare at you when you have tattoos out here too it's not as it's, <laughs> it's not wrong. as uh, open-minded as people think it's a yeah. lot of judgmental people but um you know um yeah i think it's still on the table uh, my girlfriend and i talk about it she's a, a a nurse so she can go anywhere she can go anywhere um and yeah, we're, we still look at it. I'm still on Zillow every night looking at places, <laughs> but you know, ideally the end goal is to have a house with a shop and, and yeah. do all that, you know, and be able to have some freedom in that aspect, you know? Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of places in America that offer great landscapes and kind of more the outdoor activities like you're mentioning, but they, the, the one thing is like, it's, it's the climates. Yeah. I mean, you I know. don't want to go somewhere where there's nine months of snow. Exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? And as you know, me and my wife just driving through Washington and Oregon here, it's like, it's so beautiful, you know, but yeah. then you're like, it rains after the third day of the rain, you're like, all right, man, like there's the sun over there. Let's, yeah. let's yeah, try yeah. to get towards it. And, um, or whether, you know, like we, I'm from Dallas, like every once in a while it snows. Hmm. Well, when it does, it's like, hell yeah. And then it's gone in like a day or two. Yeah. And then, you, so you're not really uh, living within these uh, climates in the same way. And, you know, the places like I love or- uh, Oregon, I love uh, Portland, the city. It gets hmm. a bad rap, but I like it up there. Um, they have a lot to do in that aspect of everybody's inside during the winter you know what i mean yeah so they have a lot of indoor activities up there yeah, which yeah. i like going up there and it's only an hour and i think it's like an hour flight from here yeah so um i'm i'm like what i really miss or not miss but like what i really want to try to surround myself with 
is other creative people. Yeah. And f- like whether that is custom painters or photographers or what whatever space, right? Mm-hmm. Just those conversations you can have with those people are more uh, motivating. And like I said, I, I'm in this phase where like I just want to learn. Yeah. And you well, know, uh, trying to find places that have more of those type of people typically end up in the biggest populations. Your LA's, San Francisco's, yeah. New York's, and yeah. I can't yeah. afford to. I can't afford that inspiration. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> I mean, San Francisco is a whole different. We could talk a whole podcast about there i mean I, i've i've watched the romance get drained from that city for the past few years and wow. it's like it's my home you know yeah. i was born there i lived there for a long time and to watch it kind of lose its romance of the city by the bay and all that stuff mm-hmm. and to what it's really become it's it's really hard and i'm not like a pol- political person i don't really care either way yeah but to just to see what's what's been done there it's, it's really hard and that trickles up here i mean yeah. we're only an hour away from there yeah so everybody in san francisco what they did is they sold their apartment for three million dollars moved up here Mm -hmm. buy a house for eight hundred thousand cash on sight unseen yeah no inspections so then that house is now a million yeah because everybody's coming up here and the prices are going so somebody like me that's that's lived here my whole life except when i lived in san francisco is it's hard for working class people to buy a place here yeah extremely hard um so it's just it's changed the economic structure of this area Mm -hmm. um and to where a lot of people are leaving and a lot of people are coming in yeah so it's it's a real changing of the tides and i saw it happen in marin when i was a kid where Mm. a lot of people from san francisco moved to marin and then just a lot of people from marin are now moving up here yeah a lot of people from san francisco are moving up here um and it's changed the the aspect of of everyday life up here yeah you know the crime rate has gone up the prices have gone up the um you know people are getting pushed out so i keep thinking like is you know is there is there a place in america that's like that next wave of it's it's going to be rad in about 15 years i hope man if you find because i want to i want to find that place and you know i was talking with a, a buddy on a podcast last year about this and i was like you know, with us kind of making money through the internet, like why not? Why not some of these towns that have kind of fallen apart in the in the kind of like the the New Mexico kind of you know maybe Arizona areas and yeah. stuff and like you know maybe f- go in there and like I said, we're making our money through the mail, so it's not like I got to rely on that population there to survive. But maybe we can bring this whole fucking place up with yeah. some different I shit. Mean, I've had this thing in the back of my mind of like owning a badass shop like yeah. downtown in a cool downtown yeah, area dude, and have like glass front with like all your stuff like yeah. how it used to be in the 70s you know have an apartment on top have of an it apartment or something on top and the booths in the back and you're just you know just this image of that like this imagination yeah. that i have of that and um i don't that's not even going to be a possibility in california you yeah. know um like this here in sonoma county you can't get a booth permit for real yeah you can't damn that's you're you're better off getting a liquor license than you are getting a booth permit here yeah they treat paint like it's like it's the fucking devil and i straight think the up. regulations are so um based on like old lacquer days yeah like they think like if you light a match it's gonna blow up like lacquer you oh know? yeah yeah and i think that's the way it's stayed since well there. you would think that the uh the automotive paint industry would have some kind of legislative like like they would put people in those spaces to, to try to retrain the, because if you if more, I mean, I guess it, it's not a it's not a voting demographic. There's yeah. not enough people that no. do this where it's like, hey, we got to take care of the painters yeah. out there. No, there's no, I yeah, mean, there's nothing that'll change that. But I think the but no, you you're actually I never thought about that. You're, you're yeah, I the guarantee you're right. Are, are, are based on what lacquer was, you know, and I've been in. I've worked at shops where guys will have like an open heater in the booth yeah, to heat it and like literally spray the thing with clear and it not do anything. Yeah. And because I remember the first time I walked in, I was like, whoa, you got a heater in here? Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, look, and nothing happens. Yeah. You know, but not to say that it would never happen. I mean, but you'd have to really like light the really shit in a can or something, you know, fire, you know, like the solvents and everything are not as. Yeah, flammable, flammable is, is what it used to be. But yeah, that's yeah. oh man, I don't know. Like I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about you know, like coming here and talking to you, and you know, you tell me about this new brand. It's like it puts a little more optimism in me because 
I just over the last couple of years, the the trend of the direction of the custom paint industry has kind of been more of a depressing thing for me because of the materials like we, we had talked about because of like, what do I put? I need a, I'm a goal person. I need yeah. a goal to chase. Yeah. Like where, if I put in this much more of my life into this, why? You know, I talked to Steve Gibson about this subject too the other day. And, and I think a lot of us as custom painters are looking for something that we can lean on mm -hmm. because we've tried for years to lean on, Brands, uh, brands, and products that are corporized. Yeah, I don't even know if that's a word, but, um, and so this is, I feel like, my chance to really, yeah, put a put, you know, my name on something as a as a business partner with Dave, and to do something that nobody else has ever done before, and I yeah. value that I've always kind of done that. Like I've always trying to look out of the side of the box in this yeah, world. Is, yeah, yeah. like what I can do next that nobody else is doing. And this is a good opportunity for me to develop products and a brand for me mm, yeah and as a custom painter for you yeah you know so like i, I want to be able to develop products that will be user-friendly to the custom painter not looked at as what can we make off this can yeah yeah you know i think it'll i mean i think it'll easily do well in you know because i think one of the things that no one's talking about is the problems that I think we were talking about just now yeah. with the paint. It's not really publicized because I think some of us might feel like, well, maybe one day I'll get a, you know, a gallon of clear from House of Colors. So I'm not going to talk about the problems I'm having with their paints yeah, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And I think that's uh painters think that that's, that's a goal of theirs is to be sponsored by a paint company. And I'm the first guy to tell you that that shouldn't be your goal. Yeah. You know, because I've been that, I've gone there, I've seen it, I've done the whole thing, I've been on the inner workings of all this stuff. And the end goal should be you building your own business, taking care of your family, taking care of your financials, doing all that. People that think that currency is Instagram likes mm -hmm. is the wrong mindset. Yeah, yeah. You should be using Instagram as a tool to make money. Yeah. And, and people now view likes and this validation from the internet as like that's a a, a thing when it's yeah. not it's not a thing it's a it's your mind is you know tricking you to think that that, that validation is worth something when it's actually not yeah know? i think that a lot of things kind of changed when you felt like there was a you know when you felt like there was a way that like being an air quotes influencer for said brand was like a way to you know like I don't know, create more opportunities. Maybe you got better jobs out of it or what, but I think that my, my angle has always been like, man, I can't afford these fucking materials, man. If I got to a point where maybe not free, like I pitched a thing to them a long time ago when the last time we did a podcast was like, what if, what if you had a, a set of painters, right? These were, mm -hmm. these were the house of color painters of 2024. And instead of, you giving me thousands of dollars of free materials. What if you allowed me and the other painters within this that were a part of your team to be able to log in and order the products that we need at the price that you're selling it to the the other people for the distributor? Yeah, because I'm not. It's not so much that I want it for free. You know, hell, at least back then I'd be able to. Hey, I'm I'm painting my own personal bike. Can I get a fucking gallon of clear? Yeah. And they do that at least every once in a while. But that dried up too. But it's like. You know, like incentivize this, you know, and then I'll keep answering all these questions that you pay somebody to do online. <laughs> I, I, I used to talk about how I, I, w I would be their tech person. Yeah, because they're going to ask you before somebody that works there. Because I'm in the tech videos and somebody's yeah. not answering the phone. For sure. And their next step is, well, I saw this guy in the tech video. Yeah. I'm going to reach out to him. And... I finally was just like, man, like you guys got to do something about this because I can't do this. I yeah. can do this as a full time job, and they're going through my social media to do this. Like it's just clogging up what I, my real customers, yeah. are coming in and asking me about. Um, I approached it as, as me being an influencer for Monster and Full Throttle Energy is is in that realm, right? So mm -hmm. I approached it as, hey, why don't you guys get everybody that's a top tier influencer in their respective fields of motorcycling, 
low rider, car building, all this other stuff. Let us do your advertising and be in, uh, and do everything for you, right? Give us X amount of month and and money. Give us X amount of month in product, mm -hmm. and we'll do the rest. Yeah. But nobody's the face of the brand. Yeah. So yeah. many people over there are trying to be the face of the brand that they're not really looking at the thing as a whole. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? I, so, I remember that. Yeah, that was part of the conversations I was having with them because they were like, "Well." do you think that so-and-so should still be the face of the brand? And I'm like, well, I never really thought about it like that. Like, yeah. like you guys need a, you guys need a, a fucking Elon Musk, right. To sell your Teslas when like, it's cool to have a lineage, but maybe, maybe focus more on instead of a person, maybe just use this current day and age, but yeah. do it deliberately. Have an army of influencers yeah. that do it for you. Yeah, you know, and like just with Monster and everybody else, there's a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be promoting somebody else's brand. You're not going to be wearing anybody else's shit. You're not going to be using anybody else's shit. So that's all part of the code of conduct in that. And if you are in this contract and you don't do those things, yeah, you're done. Yeah, and that's how it should have been approached. But it's such the wild west. So me coming into this brand, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm going to build an army of influencers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take everybody that I know and give them the products and make sure that they're happy with it. If we need to change or add or tweak or do anything that we need to do. Yeah. And then once that happens, Hey, this is what we're using now because this is the shit. And that's yeah. what I want to do. I don't want to do the, Hey, this company's paying me to do yeah. this. You know, like I don't want that. I, I just want to be able to create cool products that are working and that are good and that yeah. are functioning as a custom painter because anybody can go spray base and then go spray clear and walk away. Like we were talking about, Yeah, there's multi layers and taping and adhesion and that has to happen. Um, so that's my goal is I'm going to create a tier system influencer program, which I'm already working on. I'm working on the technical data sheets right now. Yeah. Um, that's truck. it's going to be very easy i think it'll be super easy for you to kind of uh build that up and it'll be i mean they kind of they i think that the rest of the customer or the rest of the paint industry has, has put them in that boat because they've put little effort into this side of it that it's just going to be easy for so many people to transition over into that world yeah. uh, in, into this side of things based on you know i knew it was a matter of time before i started you know when that ace of shades and some other people have been popping up and I haven't used any of their products. So I, I don't know, yeah. but I, I knew, okay, I see, a, I see a market now. If you're a big company like Sherman Williams, who owns Valspar and house of color and matrix and all these, it's, it's hard for them to carve out a tier for this. But if you're a smaller company and you're building yeah. up, the then com the comparison of, of refinish with custom is never going to be yeah the same. Right. So the model that taking, uh, from refinish and applying it to custom paint is the same. It's never going to work. Yeah. So you have to go direct to consumer, right? You have to develop products that are going to work in the environment that are meant to work in. You know, yeah. I'm not going to take a, a clear that's only supposed to be a two coat clear and tell custom painters that they could put four coats and then all of a sudden they have problems and you wonder why. Yeah. You have to have a clear that's going to be able to bury graphics. It's not built for speed. Yeah. In production, it's built for longevity. And yeah. I want the most UV absorbers in it. And I want the best solvents used in it. I want the best resins in it. You know, that's the type of stuff. Um, what, when you get into the paint world and you realize that it's all just a big relabel game. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's all it is. This person is making this product for this company and putting their label on it and they're competitors. Yeah. But because it's cheaper for this company to buy it from them because they have the manufacturing facility and the products to do that, it makes good sense for business. And that's yeah. all they're seeing. So that's the type of stuff that I'm getting away from. And and Dave and I are working on this project together to do this. Um, no, I think that'll be really good, man. We need it badly. Uh, guys like me, I think a lot of other people I've known, you know, that I've talked to that have been in the game for 20 years, a lot of us are kind of like, you know, we want to we want to focus on evolving our our skills and our and the styles and the trends of, of custom paint and not focus on how to learn how to do it with lesser quality materials. Yeah, you don't want to worry about the paint. You want the paint to support yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. You want the paint. Hey, that's a good fucking slogan on the can <laughs> right there, dude. 
<laughs> so, and that's what it's become. And I, you know, I didn't realize it at first. And then over years of me, like when I first started doing panels and you start shooting some uh, KK colors on top of things and it's like, okay, cool. And then a couple months later, it's like, why is the tape tearing that off now? Yeah. Oh, maybe I didn't stand it good enough. You go through the gambit of all the things that you think you did wrong yeah. until you like now. And you still feel like when you go talk to the job or you're going to be told you're an idiot, you didn't do it right. Well, you know, and you're and, like, well, how the fuck did I do this for 15 years? And then now all of a sudden the the process in which I've done it and it's worked is not working anymore. Like yeah. I didn't change anything. You didn't change. The product's changing. Exactly. Yes. And that's yeah. what happens is. And granted revenue driven corporations like that yeah if they can pull something out yeah they're gonna pull it out if they're gonna take more uv absorbers out of the clear to save costs they're gonna do it yeah they're not they're not looking at the end result of like a creative person mm -hmm. like i'm gonna this thing's gonna be around for 30 years yeah yeah they're looking at it as i'm taking this production clear i'm gonna put a different label on it and put it in the custom line yeah yeah it's it's a it sucks, man. And, yeah. and I'm, 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 you know, I, I had no idea that you guys were working on that project. So you telling me today is like this is the first I've talked about it, and the first I've revealed it to anybody. Um, we still got a few things we got to dial in, but the clears are amazing. That you know we've talked about. Um, now we're working on color. Hmm. We've already dialed in the candy dyes. I've already dialed in a lot of the, like the the. Um, more or less the, base coat the can, universal like the, things that we have to use in almost yeah, everything. Yeah, like the job. regular base coats, like really high, chunky, silver, metallic base yeah. coats that are really good for a ground coat for a candy. Yeah. I've dialed in all those. Um, the undercoats are really good. There's a couple products that I can't talk about that we're coming out with that nobody nice. else has. That's a little trick up my sleeve that I've been yeah. working on. Um, you know, and there's just all the different dry pearls, which is like, if you think about it, there's only a couple places that are making these pearls. Yeah. So when you go to those places and buy the pearls, guess what? You realize how much they cost in comparison to what these companies are selling them for. Yeah. And it would shock you. Yeah. I, I bet. Well, yeah. if you got four layers of, uh, of distribution going on, like they all have to have their money in it, but yeah. there are all those pearls that, uh, I'm, I'm sure you heard about the tsunami and the plant in Japan that used to make those pearls that were, uh, in those, um, like some of the sun glow pearls that used oh. to come in the Harleys and, and even yep. PPG had those ones that were real wild that they yep. had to discontinue. The radiance pearls. Oh, bro, yeah. like I still, every once in a while you see someone in a body shop just has a can of like, hey man, let me let me buy that off yeah, you. Let me buy that off you. <laughs> you know? Well, well, and the other thing is it's exciting because this is kind of like phase one that we're coming out with, right? Yeah, the base, um, get the bases done, right? The bases, the, and we're doing all factory packs. Okay, nice. We're not doing the confusion of hey i'm gonna do an effect with this you know transparent toner and all this other stuff yeah sorry guys we got a we got a leaf blower outside so <laughs> he's going by i swear they were doing it earlier too yeah they just said hey i think they're doing something important there let's go every monday let them know we're here <laughs> um what the cool thing See here. They only last a few minutes usually. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna run down and do some influences in the wild stuff on the bridge, and then yeah, definitely get out up. of here before two if you could for yeah, traffic. Then, yeah, well, we're not gonna go into San Francisco. We're gonna dip back up to. So, uh, have you uh, ever been up to like Battery Spencer? Yeah. Well, and then go to like down to the missile silos and all that. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's my shit. I, Hercules, and then go down to Cronkite and all that. Yeah, yep. I love that. I don't know that that. So we used to fly kites there when I was a kid. For real? Yeah, and Point Bonita, right on the other side of those batteries that are down farther towards the Hercules missiles. More. Yeah. We used to. There's a little area, picnic area. We used to fly kites and have picnics there when we were kids. Oh. Yeah, we used to have parties at that and. Yeah, all that. Area. All that stuff there. I mean, the first time I ever came here and got that perspective of san francisco just looking from up there it was like i don't know it's one of the few spots in america where 
just sitting there is like a recentering, uh, like a, almost like a, it's motivating, you know? I think it's all the water. Yeah. It's all the pi- positive ions coming out from the, the ocean water <laughs> down there. We go down there and fish for halibut right in that cove. For real? Yeah, we've, we've done a lot. There's a nice sandbar that sits right there, and you just... Get a lot of halibut. Being right being in like San Francisco proper, like it, it's a vibe, it's cool, but that perspective to me is more yeah. like refilling, if you yeah. will. Um, yeah. Same thing, like dri- riding, especially riding bikes uh, back and forth across the Bay Bridge is one of those things that really uh, that bridge is more wild to ride across, in my opinion, than Golden Gate. But it's like because of how high you are, almost. Yeah. In, in perspective to like you have the buildings right there so you're yeah, looking you're like going into the city proper, yeah like you're going just dumps yeah. you right on to whatever that road is but yeah but, yeah they out there just man that, that parking lot better be clean well, as yeah, fuck when we get down eat here. off that thing um yeah well i think that the paint thing I, i'm i'm like i said before i'm really really stoked that you guys are doing that because that's like i said and i'm kind of saying it again but that's been probably one of my biggest reasons why i haven't like really wanted to pursue paint the same way because it's been hard every painter's feeling right now. yeah that's so every i mean everybody i've talked to about this that i've kind of bounced it off them loosely is is said the same thing you're saying yeah like we're out here in the trenches and these people aren't supporting us exactly and i'm wanting to be that person that supports these people yeah and it's not anything that is is i mean i could sit here and paint all day yeah and make money this isn't i don't have to do this dave yeah financially secure himself he doesn't need to do this yeah we're doing this because we want to yeah um and that's the that's the perspective of where we're coming from with this we could do whatever the fuck we want yeah yeah and that's the cool thing but it's also scary and things that scare me i like turning around and facing them yeah so this thing is really made me like i'm scared you know this yeah, is a big yeah. thing for me and it's walking away from a company that i've worked with forever that has kind of turned their back on me and a lot of other painters yeah and that's a big thing in this world is like you know to be a monkey on a stage for years and thinking that you were going to get an angle and go, go somewhere and be something with this company and then all of a sudden it's like well, these people all left and quit, and we fired all these people, yep. and uh, we're going to downsize and get rid of all this stuff. And uh, sorry, yeah, we're not going to take care of you anymore. And we're not, you know, we're not listening, you know. And we're not listening. Hey, we're, this is what we may go go make everybody else want to use it, you know. And it kills me to see products that companies are coming out with. It's like for me, it's like I'm not a big chameleon guy. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a four color shift, two color shift, six color and it's shift. It's not that. It's not that desired in our industry. It's not that desired. And to get excited as a company to be coming out with these things. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sit here and talk shit, but it's just like it's facts, right? Like nobody gives a fuck about chameleon colors. If nowadays. anything, the, the, the paint manufacturers should be leaning on us. Yes. Because we're the ones that are creating the trends in which sell their paint. Well, that and, and uh, leave, I, I, leave chameleons to the vinyl yeah, guys. Yeah. They yeah. want to wrap cars and do vinyl chameleon stuff. Leave it to them. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's fine. But there was a reason why people stopped using it in the 2000s is because one, it was super expensive. Yeah. And two, it just kind of got ugly. Yeah. It became like a, a gimmick more than anything. I mean, if I mean, think GM about- is coming out with a Camaro that has color shifting paint on it. That's you know you're at the end of the line when it comes to a color. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so. Yeah, I mean you you've been around long enough to remember all the gimmick companies that would come out with like the color cha- the the touch changing the the like yeah the soft touch clear yeah the, um, yeah the color changing with the heat of your hand um, all that stuff you paint you paint something and then it would you clear it and it'd be black and then would it heat up and just transition into yeah. this paint job and i you know early on like i was like oh that'd be cool to be able to pull stuff like that off and then what i started realizing later on was that chasing gimmicks to sell my art is not me selling my it's art a anymore race to the bottom yeah That's i want i want to create like you said more or less timeless things and i don't want it to be because i use glow in the dark paint to make it happen or yeah you know, not talking shit, but I don't want you to be able to flip a switch and half my paint job turns on. <laughs> like, I don't, that's not, 
<laughs> if 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 you've got an angle to make that cool, then that's yeah. you. But like for me, that I feel like I've sold out at yeah. that point. Yeah, and this is we got to bring some punk rock attitude into custom paint. <laughs> and that's you know, it's it's going towards this corporate machine, and this is my way of doing punk yeah. rock. Yeah, you know, and um, I don't know, just just being able to do this with somebody that gets it too, like Dave, is really like put a a, a new flame into my fire there you go you know because um like i said we don't need to do this mm -hmm. we're doing it because we see a need for it we know that people are want it mm -hmm. um and i think it's going to be good for everybody nice you know well i'm stoked i'm stoked man i'm, I'm yeah. glad to know that you're behind it too because like i said i know that it's backed by somebody that has real world experience yep. you know and you know what you do, what, what we do with paint is we're taking, we're manipulating it to work. And so when you have someone like you in there who, and on top of, you said his name was Dave, Dave, yeah. Dave, who has all this more or less nerd energy, you know, not, not as a bad word, but like, you know, you got, you've, you're a chemist, dude. Like yeah. that's a nerd. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> it's a nerd in a good way. It's a nerd in a good way. Um, and you're bringing these two worlds together to me like that's a that's a good like symbiotic kind of thing going on there and you know i don't know if you've experienced this with painters but like a lot of painters out there try and push try and push products from the refinish world and push them into the custom world and it doesn't like have you ever seen like a helmet in the, and you could say well that's a 1996 honda color on there yeah. i could tell right away and they you know what they did is they went to the paint store and they said wow i like this colored ship but mix me up a pint of this gold yeah and you're like you know it doesn't really look right yeah you know what i mean and people do that because one cost and two it's just like there's that's all they have yep so and the product doesn't hold up to what the standards of custom paint need right so this is these are all things that i think about yeah yeah you know like well some colors look good on the surface size of a car like like remember it's like that orange that came out on like camaros and corvettes a long time yep. like maybe 10 years ago and everybody's like oh it's the baddest orange in the world and you paint it on a bike and it just looks muted yep. Yep. you know and it's it's like a, on smaller surfaces you can kind of get away with flashier things yeah. you know and there's a lot to it i mean the figuring out you know um there's one or two companies that make aluminum yeah mica that you can use for silver yeah that's produced in america right mm -hmm. so if you go to them like we've done and say we want the chunkiest baddest one and i'm going to take that and i'm going to mix it with another one to where it has the coverage but also has that crazy bling right? yeah yeah as a base coat but then you have to take that and you have to make it a base coat so it comes Aluminum paste is is flammable, right? It'll explode on yeah. itself as a dry form. So they put it in turpentine, I think, or uh, not turpentine, mineral spirits. And you have to take that as a paste in a ratio to a base coat binder to make it actual automotive silver okay. base coat paint, right? Mm -hmm. So if I have that, and let's say I put 15 to 20% of that into my binder, well, now the droplets of that are way more than the binder will allow it to adhere. So mm. imagine those droplets are spraying onto your panel and there's not enough binder to aluminum. So what's that mean? Yeah, it's like a Adhesion problems. Yeah. So that's what a lot of these companies that are coming out with these badass silvers don't realize is like, one, there's, I'm not even going to say the name of the company, but if you added more binder to it before you spray it, like I normally do with that silver, yeah. it sticks amazing. If you take it and reduce it right out of the can and you go to tape on it, the silver is delaming it from itself. Mm. It's silver on your tape and there's still silver on the yeah, panel. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that. And so <clears throat> you have to find that percentage in that base coat line where it's a happy medium, but where you're getting the coverage, yeah. but you're also getting the adhesion. So too much aluminum in that percentage, you know, I think it's around eight to ten percent or whatever is the happy spot. Yeah. We'll make it to where it adheres, but it also gets the coverage in three coats, right? So that's all stuff that I've had to go down that rabbit hole with Dave and be mm -hmm. like, <clears throat> we want a badass chunky silver. It's a staple in any line. Yep. You can do it to make all sorts of different things too. What are we going to do? Well, let's go explore aluminum 
mica pigments yeah and then go from there so that's what we're doing we're not taking existing company yeah. stuff relabeling and putting it in our line so this is designed by a painter with a chemist to be a custom paint line yeah it's yeah. gonna be good man yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it <clears throat> so these on the road podcasts i don't get to run them as long as i'd like to but that's man right. i could talk all day it's I tried to do this last year. We, we had some scheduling issues when I was passing through last year, but I'm glad we did and definitely got to do some more shit, man, especially yeah. well, I, appreciate I don't get to hang out with custom painters much. And when I do, it's like I start talking in a way that like I have and I it's like a, I'm communicating more than I'm uh, preaching, if you will. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So that's one thing that's nice about the classes, too, is you get a group of painters around and all of a sudden you guys start talking paint yeah and that's what happens on right what we just happened yeah you know we start talking in paint terminology next thing you know three hours go by yeah <laughs> i do appreciate it man i'm really yeah, excited about the you. line yeah, uh I appreciate it. it's uh rogue custom finishes have you all like started any kind of marketing like as far as like socials and stuff yet or we got the socials um going we have the website going um it's all coming out we haven't launched it yet so mm -hmm. this is the first time kind of prepping it getting it ready yeah well, like i said i think it's you know if you're if you're doing yeah i mean you know everybody in the industry so like i, I yeah dude i don't see yeah, it being besides a problem. all the stuff i'm just excited to show people yeah something that they can get excited about as a painter you know yeah so it's going to be fun I, i'm looking forward to it but yeah i appreciate you having me on it's been it's been real it's been cool. good Maybe you guys have heard the uh, the Frenchies up there snoring the entire time. <laughs> they didn't make an appearance because the heater's on. <laughs> so. All right, Taylor, I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, man, thank you. All right.